Hello people, I am Galactic from Galactic's Tutorials, and I will fully teach you everything that you need to know about GIMP. You think that's nasty, pal? I'll show you. In my last video on GIMP, I did a pretty terrible job since I didn't know what I was actually talking about. However, I've spent two years learning about GIMP, and I feel fairly prepared to teach you everything that I know. So we'll split this tutorial into a few separate videos. This one will teach you the basics of GIMP and how to download it and use it like Photoshop, where you can paste people's faces on pictures of bananas and whatnot. The next video will teach you how to use GIMP like an artist. The one after that will teach you how to use it like a graphic designer. And the last one will teach you how to use it like a photo editor. And I'll provide some more helpful resources on that. So let's get started. The first thing you need to do is download GIMP. Now I'm on a Mac, but for Windows and Linux, this is the same exact process. So just follow along. Go to GIMP.org, click Download, then click the link that says Download GIMP. My version is 2.8, but yours could be a later version. Either way, it'll still work from GIMP.org. It's virus free, I promise, so once it is downloaded, just double click it and open it. Then drag out the GIMP program and put it on your desktop or in your applications folder, etc. Then double click the GIMP icon and it should load. So for Windows users, the tabs are on the top of the GIMP main window. For Mac users, the tabs are on the top of the screen. But that's the only real difference here, so let's proceed to talk about how to use the basics of GIMP. So generally, when we use GIMP, we work with tools and with image layers. Now, to see those, we must open up a toolbox window and a layers window. To do that, go to the Windows tab and click Toolbox. Then go to Dockable Dialogs and click Layers. Then click the little arrow and click Add Tab, Channels, Paths, and Undo History. The reason we're doing this is because these are the most commonly used tools in GIMP. So now that we have them, we're ready to work in GIMP. In order to work on something in GIMP, we must go to File. We can either create a new file and select the pixel size. Generally, I work with 1920 by 1080 pixels because it's HD. But we can also create a file size based on inches, centimeters, etc. These two icons switch the file from portrait to landscape. Under Advanced Options, you can go into Color Space and work with colors aka RGB color, or you can make a black and white picture, aka grayscale. You can also select fill with and fill it with background color, transparency, etc., but we're not going to focus on that. Let's just click OK. And now you have an image space to work in. But say I wanted to work on a picture that I already have. Well, just go to File, Open, and select a picture. Then click Open. Boom. I also feel like working with another picture, so go back to File and click Open as Layer, and select a picture, then open it. Now we have two images in our workspace, or layers. Let's talk about layers. To edit layers, go to the Layers window. You can do quite a few things here. You can click the eye icon and make layers visible or invisible. You can click the Link button and link the two images together, and move them by clicking the Move tool here, and dragging them with your mouse as if they were one image. You can click on their names. Click Enter on your keyboard and rename them. Then click Enter again. To edit or select a layer, simply click on that layer, and it will highlight that layer in blue, as seen here. We can move layers over one another by dragging them or clicking these green arrows. You can duplicate the layer you selected by clicking this image icon, and you can delete the layer you've selected by clicking this trash icon. To add a layer group, click the folder icon. Layer groups basically make it easier to organize layers. So to add an image to the layer group, just drag it in. To remove an image from a layer group, drag it down. We can also create new layers completely from scratch. To do that, click this paper icon. Now here you have four options. You can fill the layer with nothing but white. You can select transparency, which puts absolutely nothing in that layer. Please note the symbol for transparency in GIMP is a checkerboard. This means this is a transparent selection. Or you can fill it with a foreground or background color. Let's fill it with a foreground color, but let's change our foreground color first. So to change your foreground color, click this box over here. Then click around a bit and select a color. Then click OK. Then click OK over here. Now we have a blue layer. We'll place it in our layer group. But we don't want the blue to cover our other image. We just want it to give a blue hue. So what we do is just select the blue layer, and then go over here and lower the opacity. 
The opacity is basically the transparency of the layer. If you lower it, the layer becomes more transparent, like so. But wait, say I don't want this image in a layer group anymore. How do I delete the layer group without deleting my images? Just drag the layers out of the layer group, then select the layer group, and press the delete button. Now there is also something called modes in GIMP, and they sort of blend the layers. There are 21 modes, and they essentially turn the image you are selecting into a filter for the layers below it. So for example, if I select Dissolve on this blue layer, it will give the layers below it a gritty blue texture. We could go into all of these, but we'll just skip this until later. For now, if you want to learn about what all of these do, then click the second link in the description, or just test them out for yourself. Let's wrap up what is in the Layers window. If you right-click a layer, a list of options show up. Edit Layer Attributes changes the name of the layer. Merge Down combines the current layer with the layer under it. This is not very useful, and I didn't want to do that, so to undo an action that you did, just go to the Undo History window and click the point where you want to be at, like so. We can also expand the layer boundary size, which means that it increases the area of the layer you're working on. We'll do 700. It's somewhat useful. Layer to image size expands the area of the layer you're working on to the entire image size. Scale layer just makes this layer smaller or larger. You can scale it in either pixels or percentages. I like percentages personally, so we'll scale this layer to 90%. There is also something called Add Layer Mask. This can selectively adjust the opacity of specific regions of a layer or change its coloring slash luminosity. The blacker the layer mask gets, the more transparent it is. The whiter it is, the less transparent. For example, if we make a white layer mask and select the color gray as our foreground color, then we click this tool over here. It's called the Rectangle Select tool. Drag the Rectangle Select tool over a portion of the screen and fill it with gray using edit fill with foreground color. As you can see, it selectively makes it more transparent. Now go to select and click none to stop selecting this part of the image. We'll go over layer masks in another video in more detail to get interesting effects. To delete the layer mask, just right click it and delete. Now alpha channels. You can add or remove an alpha channel. Adding one like this makes it so when you clear or cut parts of the layer, it makes what you cut or clear transparent. Let's do this. Go to Edit and Clear. As you see, it cleared the layer. When you remove the alpha channel and do Clear, it just clears the layer with your background color. For example, mine it happens to be white. Add to Alpha Selection just selects the parts of the image that are not transparent, like so. If you have a bunch of layers that you want to delete, Make the ones that you don't want to delete invisible, then click Merge Visible Layers, and delete the visible layer, then make the rest of the layers visible again. Flatten Image just combines all the layers into one layer. Now let's look into what all the tools do. To select a tool, simply click on it. Let's use the Rectangle Select tool. This tool works in a very useful way. To use it, simply drag over a portion of your screen. This creates a selection. A selection means that you are only able to edit and use other tools in this area. For example, if I do Edit Fill with Foreground Color, it only fills this selection. The Eclipse tool works basically in the same way, except it makes ovular and circular selections. The Freehand Select tool is very useful because you can manually create the shape of your selection. Just click around your screen and you can make points. If you accidentally click in the wrong place, simply click the Delete or Backspace key on your computer. If you want to move a point, just drag it. Once you have the shape you want, just click on your first point and it makes a selection. Something cool though is that if you double click the select tool, it brings up a window. Here you can choose different options for selecting things. To find out what they do, hover over them with a mouse. There's regular selection, adding to a selection, and removing from a selection. Adding to a selection is great for selecting two separate areas at the same time. For example, let's select the hands here. And as you can see, we can select them both and clear them at the same time. We can also select feathery edges, and that makes it so that whatever we fill the selection with, let's go to edit filled foreground color, 
whatever we fill it with, it has blurred lines or smooth edges, and we can blur them further if we increase the featheriness. Another tool for selecting is the Fuzzy Select tool. I don't usually use this one, but if you want to select single areas of the same color quickly, then you can use it. The Select by Color tool is a very useful tool as well. It selects all color in that image that is similar to the color that you clicked on. For example, also another useful tip, if I wanted to fill the image with a pattern, go to Edit, Fill with Pattern, and select whatever pattern you want over here. To deselect what you've selected, just click Select None. The scissors tool is the same as the select tool, except it's a little less accurate, but takes less time to select stuff. Also, to select with the scissors tool, you have to connect the dots and then click in the center of your selection with the tool. The foreground select tool is pretty useless, and the paths tool is really for graphic design and drawing, so we won't go over them now, but we'll go over them in a later video. The color picker tool basically just picks the color of what you want. It's very self-explanatory. You can double click it and select sample radius and then increase the radius by pixels by however many you want. And basically what that does is it samples all the colors that you've clicked on in that specific radius and gives you the average of those colors. Magnifying tool, also self-explanatory. You just click on the image and it zooms inward. To zoom outward, hold control and click. If you're on a Mac, it's command and click. To use the measuring tool, just drag across your screen and you can see the measurements in pixels at the bottom of your screen, as well as the degree of the measuring tool for whatever you want to measure. If you double click on the measure tool, you can bring up an info box if you don't feel like looking at the bottom of your screen. The move tool is useful. So by default, the move tool moves layers or images. Just drag the image across the screen. If you double click the move tool, the window pops up and you can actually move selections if you want by clicking this option. Now let's open up a new picture so we have more to work with. Okay, so the crop tool, if you use it regularly by making a selection and clicking in the center, it obviously crops. But if you go into its tool options and click current layer only, then you can crop only the layer you're on, which is pretty useful. Also, say I want this picture exactly in the middle of my picture or on the bottom or whatever. Click the alignment tool, click the image you want to align, and then these buttons make it so that you can position your image wherever you want to if you think the move tool is too inaccurate. The rotate tool just rotates the image if you drag it. Or if you don't feel like dragging it, you can type in the angle you wish to rotate it. The scale tool basically works just like right clicking a layer and scaling it, except you can also scale selections through tool options. The shear tool is basically useless since we have the perspective tool. The perspective tool can stretch an image based on the four corners of the image. A cool thing you can do is make image cubes or just do whatever you feel like. Flip tool is also very self-explanatory. Just like the previous tools we've used, it can flip paths and selections as well as images, and it can flip them horizontally or vertically based on what tool options we select. The cage tool is pretty useful if you want to deform someone grossly or if you want to make someone skinnier or whatever. I suggest just making a cage around the specific part you want to enlarge or shrink because if you select the whole subject, it causes a lot of computer lag. So make points around parts where you are sure you want to edit or deform. Then connect the last dot with the first and start moving them. It may be a bit laggy though. To deform the regions you want, just drag the adjacent dots in the direction you wish to deform. Wait a while because it's laggy. Once you've deformed it, click Enter. To use the text tool, click it and drag across the screen and type in it. Then highlight what you wrote and use the text editor to change the size, font, bold it, underline, and change the color. You can also upload a pre-made text file by clicking this and then a text file. Uh, please note that all the fonts that GIMP provides are just the default fonts on your computer and you can use them for commercial use. If you use the move tool, you can move the text around the screen and you can flip it or rotate it like any other image. The Bucket tool. Just select a color and click an area of a certain color you wish to fill, or a selection, and boom, it will fill it with that color. You can also change the opacity of the color if you don't want the color to be as strong, or you can fill it with a pattern.
The blending tool blends colors within a selection or the entire image if nothing is selected. You can blend from foreground to background or select some other colors to blend like rainbow. You can change the shape of the blend. For example, we can make a swirly effect. And if we want to, uh, we can change the opacity. To blend, just click from where you want the blend to start and drag out to where you want the blend to finish. Making a short blend will have very significant contrast, and making a long blend will have lots of gradient. The pencil, paintbrush, eraser, airbrush, and ink tool are all for art or photo editing and graphic design, so we'll cover them later. The copy tool, perspective tool, and heel tool aren't necessarily useful to us either in this video, so we'll go over them later. The blur tool makes hard edges look fuzzy by clicking and holding your mouse over the edges. You can change the brush or the size of the brush here. Basically, it works just like uh, increasing the featheriness. Technically, by holding control and clicking and dragging your mouse, you can sharpen edges, but this often isn't as functional as the blurring effect is. It's command click on Mac, by the way. The smudge tool works similar to the blur tool, except this smudges colors together, and the dodge and burn tool is really only for art and shading as well, so we'll cover them later. Now we'll briefly go over what the tabs do. We pretty much know the functions of the commands under the File tab. File New creates a new file, File Open opens up an image to work on, and File Open as Layer adds another image to work on, and you can add as many as you want. Save or Save As just saves a project you are working on. It doesn't save it as a picture, but as a GIMP file, so when you click on it again, it opens up to where you left off and you can continue editing. Export and Export As exports the file in the format of a picture. The format you can use for pictures are .jpeg and .png. You can show a preview of your image by clicking the option here, and you can increase or decrease the quality and check the file size here. Please note, if you want to export transparent images like this, export it as a .png or else it won't be transparent. Under the Edit tab, we have a few commands we didn't go over. Undo and Redo are obvious, they just undo or redo your previous actions. There is also Cut, Copy, and Paste. So pretty much if you select something, you can go to Edit and Cut or Copy it. If you don't select something, then by default you just cut or copy the layer you're on. Then if you want to use or paste what you've just copied or cut, then go back to Edit and click Paste. Then you could drag it around and do whatever you want with it with the tools that you know. Then to glue it to the picture or anchor it, just go to the layers window and right click the floating selection and click anchor layer. We've already gone over clear, fill with foreground, background, and pattern. So under the select tab, select all selects the whole image and select none selects nothing. Select invert inverts the selection and makes it so that we're actually selecting the stuff outside what we previously selected. Select Float is just a quick way to cut and paste. Select Feather just smooths the edges of your selection. Select Sharpen sharpens the edges of your selection. Select Shrink shrinks your selection by a certain amount of pixels or percent. Select Grow enlarges your selection by a certain number of pixels. Select Border creates a border around your selection of however many pixels you want, and you can fill in that border with anything. And Select Rounded Rectangle just makes any rectangular selection with the Rectangle Select tool have rounded edges based on the degree you choose ranging from 0, which is regular rectangle, to 100, which is an ellipse. Under the View tab, you can toggle what you see. The only thing that I suggest is that when you want to be precise, click View, Show Grid, and you can measure everything based off the grid it provides you. To get rid of it, just click View, Show Grid again. Also, View Shrink Wrap is useful for clearing space on your desktop, and View Full Screen is also fairly helpful. Other than that, all the other view options just change the way GIMP looks normally. Under Image, you can go into mode and change it from black and white to using color. You can also change the way the colors look by clicking mode 
indexed and selecting a custom color palette. This is particularly cool looking, so it might come in handy for later. Image transform transforms the whole image, not just a single layer, by flipping it, rotating it, etc. Changing canvas size just makes the image as a whole larger or smaller. It doesn't change the size of anything in the image, just the space of the canvas size. Fit canvas to layers and crop canvas to selection is pretty self-explanatory. And print size is only useful if you're literally printing your pictures, so have fun with that if that's your thing. Scale image makes the entire image with everything in it larger or smaller. Just note if you increase the size of your image by a lot, like more than 125%, then it will look very blurry up close. Crop to selection is self-explanatory. It crops the image to your selection. Auto crop image takes out the parts of the image with nothing in it. So for example, it took out all of this empty space here. Zealous crop is useless. We went over merge visible layer here as well as flatten image. Uh, guides. I tend to not use guides because I like the grid better, but basically if you want to make some guides, here's how it works. Select a move tool and just drag from the left or the top of your screen to make guides. You can make as many as you want. To delete them, just drag them back to the left or the top of your screen. They're only useful for measuring though, and that's the purpose that they serve. So anyway, back to the image tab. For the configuring of the grid, the only things that are useful here are the spacing. You can make that bigger or smaller in pixels, also, changing the foreground color of the grid helps sometimes if you're dealing with a lot of black. Image properties is not really useful here. The layer tab is similar to the layer window. You can create a new layer. It can be white, transparent, etc. You can create layer groups, merge down. Um, stack and mask just translates to layer masks. The stuff in transparency is actually useful, though. Let's open up a new picture of this. Color to alpha makes any color you select transparent, which is very useful. Also, alpha to selection is extremely useful if you want to select transparent objects, like text or anything, really. Very useful. Transform works the same way it worked with the main image, except it's just for individual layers. Everything else is pretty easy. I'm going over the color and filter tabs in my next videos because they pertain to more complex processes. The last thing I'm going to show you is window, single window mode, and now everything is convenient. Yay. Also, if you look at the third, fourth, and I believe fifth links in the description, I provided a list of hotkeys that you can click to do things quickly in GIMP with. And they're pretty useful if you just want to do things fast or with your keyboard and don't want to click things. So before we finish this video, we'll go over some basic problems in GIMP. Want to crop an image? Crop tool. Want to make an image smaller or larger? Image, scale, image. Want to make an image black and white? Image, mode, grayscale. Want to delete the background to an image? Select the part of the image you want with the free select tool. Do select, invert. Then add an alpha channel so we can erase that part of the image and do edit, clear. And remember to export it as a .png so the background remains transparent. Want to add text? Text tool. Want to Photoshop someone's face on a banana? To do that, click File Open and select the background picture. This is the picture that you will have another picture pasted on. In this case, the banana. Now go back to File and click Open as Layer and open up the picture you wish to paste on the background picture. As you can see in the Layers window, it shows that we have two images here. Click the foreground layer in the Layers window and click Add Alpha Channel. Then go to the toolbox and click the Select tool. Zoom in a bit and make an outline around the part of the image that you want. If you mess up in your selection, just click Delete and it will delete the last point you made. To finish your selection, just connect to the first dot. Then do Select, Invert, and click Edit Clear. Select None. Good, now we have a floating head. But we want to make the head a certain size, so just go to Layer. Auto crop layer, then go back to layer and click scale layer. We want to scale the image to a certain size. We'll scale the layer by percent. Let's do 73%. Okay, good. This looks kind of weird though, so we'll drag the banana man to the top and select his face. Then we'll drag our other face forward, position the face, select invert, edit, clear, and select none. And we did it. Yay. Let's just delete a few parts. 
Good, you made your first Photoshop picture. Congrats. To export it, just do File Export. Export it as Leonardo da Vinci.jpg. Or whatever you want to call it. And, uh, done. So yeah, now you know how to use GIMP and mess around with whatever photos you want. In my next video, I'll go into more advanced things like using GIMP to draw, animate, create logos, icons, graphics, and professional looking photography. I hope this video helped you people, and I will see you all next time. Beat time.